Commission on Thursday, December 12, 2019. Uh, Candace, will you please call the roll? Sashi McEntee? Here. Craig K. Murray? Here. Sloan Bailey is absent. Alternate Barbara Kohler? Here. Lou Kias? Here. Caius. 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 I knew I said it wrong. <laughs> uh, Damon Conley. Conley is absent, and so is Judy Arnold. Uh, Dennis Rodoni? Present. Larry Loder is absent, and so is Chris Skelton. And uh, Todd Moody? Here. Alternate? We have a quorum. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I just wanted to make the announcement that unfortunately Larry was planning to attend, but earlier this week his wife passed away, so he will not. Mm -hmm. uh, he clearly has other things on his mind and is where he should be with his family. Thank you for letting us know, Jason. Okay, agenda review. Uh, does anyone want to change anything on the agenda, or do I have a... Move to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, we'll move to public open time, please. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons desiring to address the commission on any matter not on the current agenda. All statements that require a response will be referred to staff for reply in writing or will be placed on the commission's agenda for consideration at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to three minutes. Anybody want to speak on an item that is not on the agenda? So then I will close public open time and then move on to the consent calendar. Uh, these are items that are considered ministerial and non-substantive and subject to a single motion approval. Does anyone on the commission or anyone in member of the public want to pull any items from the consent calendar. Okay, seeing none, uh, any uh, public comment on the consent calendar? Uh, do I have a motion to- So moved. Okay, moved by Commissioner Kohler. I'll second. Seconded by Vice Chair Murray. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Moving right along. Uh, okay. So we are moving on to our public hearing items. We are moving to the Municipal Service Review, second draft of the Nevada Regional Municipal Service Review. Jason. Sure. Jason Freed, Executive Officer. Um, so in front of you today is the revised or second draft of the Nevada MSR. As you may remember from the last meeting, um, we did not get a lot of public comment because the word didn't get out to the public until a little bit later in the process. So we reopened public comment, allowed people to make additional comments. Um, I've had several meetings with a couple of the neighborhood groups to have discussions about what's in it, um, try and address their concerns. And so we came out with a second draft. That draft was put out last month, and because of the holidays, we're, we're extending the public comment period that you would normally need for a second draft or a revised draft. Um, and so that draft is out now for, pu for public comment. It's open until January 15th. I wanted to extend it well past the, uh, the holidays so people would have a chance to celebrate with their families, and they can come back from that and make any comments they could. Um, I, the, most of the comments that were made from a like the public's perspective, the non-agency comments, were really around um, a misunderstanding that was in the original draft around um, annexation of the islands in the area. So one of the big things we did is flush that out a little bit more, put more information in about the urban growth boundaries, and talk a little bit more about um, Lafco, Marin Lafco's policy about not doing forced mergers when the residents of the area are clearly opposed to the merger. Um, so we added that language in there, um, and so that is where the draft is at now. Uh, we've gotten back one comment so far on the revised from one, from the fire district. Uh, they had a, they had a lot of comments in the first draft. They gave us back, I think it was like four or five small comments. That is not in your packet. What is in your packet, though, is all the comments we received on the first draft. So you have all those comments that everything that was said to us. As you can see, a lot of them were just simply don't annex us. Um, and then some of the districts had quite a few little technical things that they wanted to see changed. Okay, and uh, the, uh, how we're defining sphere of influence and, and possibility of annexation is something we'll talk about in our, our retreat uh, later on. That's something that will be addressed in the future. Um, any uh, questions or comments from the commission on the draft? No? Okay, i um, open up public comment for that. Um, that looks like I have uh, Susanna Mahoney from the Black Point Improvement Club who wants to speak on this item. Coming up to the mic, you actually have a working mic over there. Okay. If it's on. On. Yeah. Yes. I'm the loudest person in the room. <laughs> That's not a common. Um, uh, my name is Susanna Mahoney, and I am president of the Black Point Improvement Club. It's the um, homeowners association for the Black Point and Green Point neighborhoods. And you may have heard uh, we got 
in a little bit of a tizzy over the first draft that went out. I think the late notice and, as Jason mentioned, the misunderstanding, the language in the draft caught everyone by surprise, and um, neighbors were quite concerned about potential annexation. Um, part, we're, we, you know, we take our, with Black Point, Green Point, we take our unincorporated status uh, very seriously and we're very protective of it. And the thought that, um, that that could be threatened or even just recommended by an agency such as LAFCO um, was concerning to folks. Uh, since then, uh, Jason has had several meetings with our group, with uh, Indian Valley, was another neighborhood that was concerned, uh, Loma Verde. So we've been able to, as he said, flush out some things and get some more language in the draft. And unfortunately, when the second draft came out, um, this was, uh, I think, late November. We haven't had a meeting. Our organization hasn't had a meeting yet to go over it. I did disseminate the information to about 360 households that I have email access for, um, sent them the draft. Uh, in particular, I wanted to pay attention to I believe it was sections 4.1 and 5.3 and discussions on the urban road boundary to make sure, see if this, if everyone's okay with this. and to contact Jason if, he, if they feel otherwise before the January 15th deadline. I have heard back from a few folks that say, I feel good, I feel confident, I think we're protected. I've heard from a couple that are still unsure um, and a legal counsel who, who's not yet satisfied, but I don't have anything yet in writing from them, but I wanted to update you all with where our group is at this point. I think, um, you know, Jason was able to address, I think, particularly giving us all more time to look at this, I think was one of the biggest things. And you had brought that up, I think, initially at the first meeting, so. Um, I think some of the pending questions um, and concerns that people are looking at closely is our definition, the definition of an unincorporated island um, and whether or not we fit into it, whether Black Point and or Green Point fit into it, and I know um, there was, also, there was a little discussion about, I, I know in the draft it says you will not proceed with annexing entire islands, but there's some concern that perhaps that leaves the door open to annex half an island, substantial part of an island. You know, we know that sometimes individual lots are appropriate for <coughs> annexation, but could there be a creep in that? So that's a little concerning for folks, and I think we're still looking at that. Um, could there, would at any time, this, this draft or this MSR leave it open for, for big chunks of our unincorporated island to be annexed. Um, also, the, one of the recommendations in the MSR is for Novato to adopt a planning area that would include areas along our boundary. And we're a little unsure about what that means, uh, what exactly a planning area would look like, and we're hoping to find some more examples of what that means, how, how deep would Novato's fingers get into the planning decisions made on the properties along the boundary of, of, um, of our, you know, a Black Point and Green Point for the edge of the city. And then also, what could potentially happen when the urban growth boundary potentially dissolves in 2037? Well, it's a long ways out, 18 years, but I think if not for the urban growth boundary, we wouldn't have as strong leg to stand on. So those are all kind of things we're looking at. Um, I anticipate we'll get some more comments to you guys before January 15th, and I uh, appreciate the extra time. Thank you. Question. Uh, Suzanne, just a yes. question. So uh, one of the things you do with the corporate areas is um, sanitary sewer service. Mm -hmm. And has your membership discussed uh, LAFCO's dual annexation policy? So if that, say, for instance, the health department comes in and someone's septic fails, then uh, there'd be a, a basically a connection to sanitary sewer uh, uh, area. And part of LAFCO's dual annexation <laughs> policy is then you agree to annex to that area that would change those boundaries. Okay. Uh, I, I could cook it. The Nevada Sanitary District doesn't have any current sewage lines that go close enough to where the dual annexation policy would ever come into play. Okay, so it'd be a major yeah. improvement. The, the, Nevada would need to, like, Nevada Sanitary would need to do a major expansion in order to get out to that area. I, I think the recycled water does come nearby. It's, it's at the adjacent Okay, place. but from a sanitary perspective, it's, it's not really possible for that to occur. Right, I think when we had 
a bunch of us did attend the your presentation to the sanitary district. They got, their office was <laughs> filled with neighbors, but um, and they made it clear that they have no interest in in bringing sewer up in that area. Although you're right, recycled water I think is right at the golf course there. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on this item? Okay. Any other uh, questions from the commission? Uh, I, I do. So um, actually, maybe Mala can um, answer this. Uh, so um, the uh, the urban the, well, the urban growth boundary and the idea of doing this planning area, that, which is sort of a new uh, thing that uh, Jason and George came up with as an innovative way to handle the situation, is that what are the implications of a planning area uh, versus being in the sphere of influence? I can actually probably answer that. Um, a planning area has a lot of different things that it could potentially do. Um, what, we're, what we're looking to do and what Nevada is really asking for in a planning area is things occur just outside of their boundaries and the urban growth boundary doesn't allow them to change. But those things that occur just outside their boundaries can have an impact on city services. Like it could impact police may end up being because of mutual aid agreements may be the ones that show up for services or the people who live in that, maybe you're building a new house, the person who lives there is going to really be using city streets for most of their driving because they're right next to the city boundaries. So they just want to be informed of what's going on so that they can be, be better prepared for future service needs that might be occurring just outside their boundary. The example I kind of use, and it's, it's not going to ever happen here, but let's just say you know Google or one of the big tech companies wanted to build a big office building out on the west side of Nevada, just outside of the boundaries, and the county said, sure, we'd love to have you come here. Well, that would have a major impact on Nevada because the only way to get to that would be to go through Nevada to get there, and that would impact all their streets and a lot of services that they provide. So this gives Nevada the ability to be more involved in what's going on. Now, Nevada and the county have a pretty good relationship, and they've been shared, they've had an unofficial agreement between them. Um, that same agreement doesn't necessarily exist with LAFCO. That same agreement doesn't necessarily exist with the fire district or with the water district or the sewer district. So what they're saying is we want to have this planning area so that they can know what's going on. They're going to have zero say as to like approvals. Mm -hmm. Nothing. They can't approve anything. All they are being is they're informed any time a project goes on that's inside the, this area so that they're aware of what's going on there so they can figure out how it impacts their services and if that huge office building thing ever were to occur, they could then make comments to the county and say, hey, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. Maybe we need to have the freeway, a, a special path from the freeway to go over there because that's the only way to get there without mm -hmm. causing major traffic problems for the city. Mm -hmm. So that's what a planning area is, what they're looking for in their version of a planning area. And as we state in the, in the revised draft of this is, we make it very clear that the part, as part of the process of creating these planning areas, the people who live in that area should be part of the discussion as well. So they're well aware of what is Nevada's interest in that area, which is really just, they want to know what's getting developed so they know how to plan for it and how it's going to impact city services. Okay, good. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, the, the idea of what, what are the implications of the sphere of influence, uh, being in the sphere of influence and um, uh, on any unincorporated islands, we are going to talk about that at our strategic planning retreat and I would invite any, uh, Susanna or anyone else from the public who's interested in that topic to come hear our discussion to have input in that in that discussion, uh, that's something that we would want to uh, you know, discuss in more of a retreat setting, uh, but we want to hear from you know, exactly the concerns that you have or the ones we want to hear. So, um, when is that happening? January 8th. It'll be in this room at 9 o'clock. Is it going to be here? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, the one thing I'll also add to the, the plan, why we're doing the planning area for Nevada and not suggesting animals, normally a sphere of influence would be what you would use instead of a planning area. But because their sphere got shrunk down, because of the urban growth boundary, their sphere of influence is their city boundaries. And so there's no way for them to use a sphere of influence in this case because they can't expand outside their city. Yeah. So we've tried to figure out what would be similar to the sphere of influence. That's a planning cool. area is yeah. what's similar to a sphere of influence. And is this something we should consider putting in our policy uh, handbook related to any area that happens to have an urban growth boundary? We could, we could absolutely, if we wanted to have a discussion about that, we could. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so this is an information item, um, and when is or when's it coming back to us? My goal is to get all the comments by January 15th, and then George has promised me to do a quick turnaround, and it should be at our February <coughs> meeting. Assume, okay. Once again, assuming that we don't get anything major that would require a third review, we would put it back out and uh, have our final draft at the, okay. at the February meeting. Good, and um, something else that um, to, for folks in the audience that uh, um, as staff is kind of going through each of these 
municipal service reviews. Um, we're sort of recompiling because we don't have, uh, didn't have the information from the uh, Jason predecessors on uh, you know, who the neighborhood groups are, who needs to be informed about these things. So uh, you know, that, uh, we, we rectified that with given the longer comment period because some people won't even notice. But this is uh, we want to know who should be getting notice about these things, and this is where we'd love to hear it from you all. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So that one was just informational. So we will move on to item five. Adoption of Resolution 1908, Reorganization of Murray Park Sewer Maintenance District to Ross Valley Sanitary District, uh, 1944. A quick question yes. for Paula. Do, do we need to open and then close public hearing? You don't need to speak to the mic. Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> 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 well, well, it's it's only we need to have a it, It's technically public. listed as a public hearing, sure. but I think you, you opened public comment, and I think there was no other public comment. So I, unless you think otherwise, I'll take that as opening and closing the public okay. hearing. Okay. Thank you, Vice Murray. I will. Uh, the next one. Um, all right, Jason, you give us a staff report. Sure. Uh, this is a, a simple staff report, hopefully. Uh, for over a decade now, at least, we have been looking to try and figure out how to merge uh, about a 90 parcel uh, Murray Park sewer maintenance or sanitary maintenance district with the Ross Valley sewer. No, no. I got it reversed. I keep on doing that. I'm sorry for the two districts. Um, to, try, to try and merge those two together because if you ever look at a map of how the sewage lines actually work, line starts in Murray Park, goes into Ross Valley's district, goes back into Murray Park's district, then goes back into Ross Valley's district, and then eventually gets over to the plant where everything gets cleaned and, and, and everything is, makes everything nice again. Um, so because this is such a small district, the county has been running it as a dependent district. Um, there were a few issues that we, we needed to work out, but we did a very robust process. I want to thank both the Ross Valley staff and the uh, county staff who worked with us. We, we did, first we did a, I did a, a meeting, thanks to Supervisor Rice's office, I was able to set up a meeting with about eight of the community leaders that lived within Murray Park. Um, met with them first to see what issues they may have, if there was going to be some objections. They were mostly all enthusiastic about it. A couple of them had some questions and it was more, personal questions about their lot with connection and, and stuff. And so we were able to connect them with the county, got them to get their answers worked out. We then did a public meeting uh, with that both uh, two of our commissioners attended, both uh, Craig and Lou attended that meeting, and we were able to get more public comment there. So this has had two hearings there. The county then did its official hearing as acting as the Murray Park District Board. Um, they were able to get comment out of that. And then Ross Valley finally followed up with theirs, both of those two districts passed a resolution that is similar in manner, based on state government code and at their request, um, based on my suggestion, they, uh, they, they sent us similar resolutions and because of the government code section that they're using, we are here today to approve a district. We can put conditions on it, but we have very limited rights to say no to it. Not that we would say no, but we have very limited rights on how we could say no to this type of an application. Um, we did work out all of the various things thanks to the Department of Finance, uh, Roy Given and his team. We were able to work out some last minute details to make sure that all the transfers of money would occur. What's going to occur is all the residents in that area will continue to keep their sewer rates until the next Ross Valley uh, rate uh, adjustment system. They do theirs every five years, so they're now in year, they've just completed year one. They're about to go into year two, so in four more years they'll do their next rate increase. Murray Park at that point will see their rate increase. They pay less than the other folks, but what we're going to be able to do is there's a reserve that's left over for Murray Park. So that money will stay and can only ever be spent for Murray Park. And what they're basically going to do is take that reserve fund and pay down the difference in what the rates should be to what they are actually paying off of their tax bills and off of any other bills that they have to pay for it. And that will then encompass, so Ross Valley, none of their residents will see any negatives on this. The Murray Park folks won't, will be able to keep their stuff and be able to do exactly as they're doing. One day you're going to flip a switch and basically, instead of the county responding to an issue that's out there, Ross Valley will simply respond to the issue. And we're going to be timing that based off the fiscal year so everything rounds out nice and neat. So our approvals today will allow us to kick off that process and then come the start of the next fiscal year, Murray Park, for all except for some technical purposes, won't exist anymore. Um, there'll be some accounting stuff that needs to occur, but otherwise that you will have finally completed a what has been an over 10 year project. Vice Chair Murray has a question. Um, so Jason, when we met um, over Puerto Madera, it was pretty obvious there's some roads, and I think Jason alluded to this, this kind of meandering line where the road was partially in this area and partially out. It, 
do we have an opportunity to try to clean that up uh, so the road is either in or outside of this area? Well, the whole thing is we're putting the whole area into Ross Valley, so there'll be no more line distinctions. So that other area is not unincorporated, it would be part of all Ross Valley? Well, Ross Valley Sanitary District, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's still unincorporated over there. Two parcels in Murray Park are part of Larkspur, but the rest of the district is um, in unincorporated county, but that's not really relevant for the sanitary district purposes. Okay, great. And we do have county and, and staff here if you have any questions for them directly. Commissioner Kais. So just to clarify and summarize, both the parties, the responsible parties for Murray Park and the responsible parties for Ross Valley have both been briefed and have seen all the terms and conditions, and they both accept all those with that reservation. Correct. Right. They, they voted on it, and it's a part of your packet now. That's the important thing. Yep. OK, I will open the public hearing. Does anybody want to make any comment from the public? OK, seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission. Any further comments from the commission? Just I thank the staff, um, I think both the county and Ross Valley. And that's a great job. In the, initial meeting and that was very clear and I think uh, a lot of questions were answered for folks that weren't familiar with the process so very good job. Yeah, this is good old fashioned LAFCO stuff so this is this is a, a great uh, great one to check off our list Jason thank you very much. My pleasure. Right. Um, does anyone want to make the motion? I'll make the motion to approve the resolution. Okay. Wait. Moved by Commissioner Kais. I'll second. Seconded by Vice Chair Murray. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, we move on to our third public hearing, item number six. Uh, adoption of. Uh, Can you close the public hearing? Did, didn't I get? Did I close the public hearing? I thought I did. I'll put close public hearing. I thought I, I, thought I did that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh, so, uh, item number six, Jason, wants you. There are three different resolutions. Yeah. Here. So. In front of you is item number six. This was presented in full at the last commission meeting, so I'll skip the full presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to go back to it. What you have in front of you today is the applicant has now um, submitted a pre-zoning application with the town of Tiburon, which is something that they had requested before we did anything. Um, they are currently reviewing that pre-zoning application. Um, and so what, what I am suggesting today and the applicant um, for this is here and agrees with, with staff recommendation on this is that we divide this application up. I know we like to do dual annexations and do everything at the same time. Reality is the pre-zoning part is going to take a while to do and the applicant I believe has an interest in connecting to the sanitary district sooner rather than later. Um, so because of that if we approved everything all together as part of the dual annexation process is one piece you would end up holding up the ability to annex into the sanitary district until everything is done with the pre-zoning process, which could take up to a year. We don't really know how long, but could take a while, which would hold up the applicant's ability to join the sanitary district. So what I am suggesting today is that we divide the application up into two files. One file would be annexation into the sanitary district, and you approve that today so that we can move forward on that application and that we can process, finish that processing period. And then the second part would be to annex uh, into the town of Tiburon with the condition that the pre-zoning process be completed first. Um, and that would be, and we would be done with, with this out from the commission's perspective, all of yours perspective, we would be done with everything at that point. There would still be stuff that occurs on the staff side. We have to make sure things are done. If this took more than a year to complete, the applicant would have to come back um, and ask for an extension. We would you would have then have the right to to give that extension if you so desire. Um, so there is so so that would give us that would be the only thing that would potentially you'd ever come back and hear this thing for. I did give you several other options in case you wanted to vary how things work, and I can go into all those options, or you can just take staff's recommendation. I'll, I'll yield to you. Can, the can you tell us about the uh, letter from Tiburon that oh. just arrived here? Yes, you might might have had a chance to read it. Yeah, earlier today we received a letter from Tiburon. Um, basically explaining what their position is on all five options. Uh, for all five options, they would not contest staff's record, staff's, the, the five areas. Um, I don't know what non-contest means, but they're not contesting them. If we ever went with option number three, which is not one I'm recommending, they are reminding us that we would want to actually make sure that as part of the sanitary district one, that we put a condition that they would not oppose future annexations into the town of Tiburon. But since from my personal perspective, I'm not sure that's 
super necessary because the applicant said, I want to be part of Tiburon and has the application in front of us already. So we could add that in there if we wanted to. I'm not so sure it's, it's as necessary, um, but that is something that they did make a comment in their letter on. So just a clarification, the Santa sewer service will go to Cordillera, not Tiburon, but the one of the annexations is uh, go to this within the town of Tiburon's area. And Jason, maybe you could explain why all of this isn't in the town of Tiburon, why the sanitary uh, Well, the, the Tiburon doesn't have its own sanitary district. There is a Tiburon sanitary district name. Uh, they don't cover this part of Tiburon. Uh, Corte Madera Sanitary District Number Two covers this part of Tiburon. Tiburon actually, I think, is covered by three different sanitary districts. Correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I will uh, open unless anybody has any other questions. I just remind us all that at the last meeting, we said that we would move forward with your option number one, essentially, and kind of made that commitment. It seems like a good thing to do then. It's supportive of what would be good for the parties involved. And so I think it's a great way to put it. I think it's a good, appropriate thing to do. And again, we've already discussed that. OK. Uh, I will open the public hearing. Um, would you like to uh, add anything? Um, uh, also, Commissioner? Well, I do have a, co a comment. Um, as we go through this, I'm sensitive to uh, when LAFCO makes a, a move to do something like that, that we don't impact um, a constituent in a, inadvertently. So, so we ended up doing this dual thing. Uh, where we annexed to the sanitary district, annexed to Tiburon, and it ended up delaying the project for months, right? And costing a lot of, uh, you know, effort and time. I, I assume that the, um, that the applicant wanted to be annexed to Tiburon. So that's, that's fine, that's, that's on you. But if, if somehow we can find a way to be sensitive so that uh, our constituents aren't delayed by months and months because of the actions that we take. And um, that's just a general comment. Uh, in, this, in this case, if we had been a little smarter, we might have been able to annex to the sanitary district first and then take our time with the other and not impact the constituent. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Seeing that, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, so uh, just to, to alternate Commissioner Moody's um, comment there that might be something to put on our list for the policy committee to, to think about um, as far as our dual annexation policy, maybe adding in some sort of uh, consideration of, of the time. We could have taken that action at the last meeting. The commission chose not to. So I mean, we're, we're delaying by one meeting this this action occurring. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, agreed. I think it's you know not not significant yeah. that we added, but uh, I think your point is well taken. I think yeah. it's something we no, maybe just consider. just one more extra phone call at Tiburon. I realize there's difficulty there, but somehow, is this going to be a problem? So um, I'll move staff recommendation or item one. Okay, uh, just one moment. I have one comment from Vice Chair Murray. So, Jason, just a real, uh, I know this is a pre planning uh, reference there. Uh, should that really fall to the city or the uh, local government agency rather than uh, LAFCO? I, all I'll say at this point is I think that there was some confusion between parties as to what needed to occur and when um, between both the applicant and the town and us. I think that there was just some misunderstandings on some early communications that occurred. Um, as I stated at the last meeting, I tried to have several, tried several times to have meetings with the town and was never successful in getting those meetings. So I think that there's a lot of things that could have been done differently on this application to try and move things quicker. You know, I always take a lessons learned off of it. Any application that comes through, like how can things be done better or differently next time? And I will always look to implement things in a better way if ever possible. Well, I appreciate your work and also getting the letter from the town of Tiburon. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. So we're all, all on the same page now. Yeah, very good. Okay, so we have a, a motion made by uh, Commissioner Rodoni. Do we have a second? Okay. A second by Commissioner Caius. Close the public hearing. Uh, so I did, I. I've now done that twice. Uh, after you did open it. Close public hearing. Yeah, I know. Close public hearing. Bring it back to the commission. So maybe everybody's not hearing me say that. Sorry. Yeah, close sorry. public hearing. Um, <laughs> we've got a motion. We've got a second. Um, uh, do, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to the uh, business items. Okay. Um, so for. First business item, it's the approval of a contract with Alyssa Schiffman, who does our bookkeeping services. 
Um, just some quick background on, on oops, yeah, that's the wrong one. Just some quick background on, on this. Um, this was an agreement that was in place prior to me taking office or taking the executive officer position. Um, a little, originally, bookkeeping services was all done through the county through its MUNA system. We got removed from that system prior to me being here. I don't know all the details behind it, but we were, we opened up our own system. As part of that, we needed to get our own bookkeeper. Originally, we used Alyssa through the Southern Marin Fire Protection District because she does all of their bookkeeping stuff, does their accounting stuff for them. And she works four days there and has some side stuff and we're one of her side things that she does on the fifth day um, as an independent contractor. So we originally had that. The last agreement, that the current agreement that we have with her expires at the end of this month. Um, it's not the way I, I always like to do, as you might remember when I first started, I always said we, we should move our contracts to the end of the fiscal year, not the end of the calendar year, so everything's together. We know what our costs are going to be for future years. So one of my goals with this applicant, with this contract is to renew it actually put it into a contract that is one of our standard contracts. Not The current contract we have with her is actually a moratorium of understanding. And I've always been baffled by how we have a moratorium of understanding. Memorandum of understanding. Memorandum of understanding. MOU, whatever the M stands for. We have an MOU with her, and I've never understood how that exactly took place. But it's what was there, what was giving us the ability to use her services. And I've been very pleased and very happy with her services. I definitely want to keep her on board. Um, She's helped us quite a bit, uh, both me understanding how we do our stuff here, but also just her understanding of how all this stuff works. She also has a very keen understanding of the MUNIS system, the county's accounting system, which is key and critical for us because we still have stuff that goes through that system. So you can't just pick any random bookkeeper off, of, uh, off the street to do stuff. They actually have to be someone who understands MUNIS um, in the system. So what we did is we took a standard contract that BBK has given us to use. It's a, we have two different types of agreements. This is a, what's referred to as a letter agreement. It's a simpler, more standardized version of an agreement, uh, which is perfect for these types of scenarios because we don't have a complex company that we're involved with. You have a red line in front of you uh, in the packet. Um, as I will always do, I will. there are some sections that are just yellow highlighted sections where we just plug in names and things like that. I left one of those in there because it was, it was kind of complicated and I just left it in there. But most of those I take out and just fill in the information and we don't actually see that part change. But any changes to the standard contract that we have been given by BBK are always redlined, and that is what you see in front of you today. Um, there is one part that I do want to have a discussion about. Uh, on page three, we currently, she, because of the, work, the limited amount of work that she does, she, she has not up until now had any sort of professional or general liability insurance. We are being instructed by legal counsel that that is a very good thing for us to have. Um, over, since I've done this, staff report because there's always a little bit of gap between when we have to put the, the staff report out in the meeting. She has been looking to find um, those services uh, throughout through uh, private vendors to, to get to us. Um, she has found someone who can offer her the services. Uh, because she has multiple clients, she's not going to charge us the full amount for, the, for those agreements. Uh, what she wants to do instead is we would wipe out all the changes that you see on your screen on page three, um, all that top section. All those changes would come out of the agreement uh, or would stay in the agreement, I should say. We would no longer delete them. Um, but what she would ask in return for, for keeping those in there is to increase our costs. Uh, if you go to page one, which I will scroll in the wrong way there, you will see her cost breakdown. You'll see right here where it says 130, the bottom paragraph, uh, through 630, 2020. What she wants to do is raise that to 142, um, which is a $12 increase. Keep in mind, we use her for about 30 hours a year. so. Well, maybe twelve dollars an hour, thirty hours out of the course of a year is not all that much in, in the grand scheme of things. We are getting that at a at a decent rate compared to what the insurance actually would physically cost if we were to if we were to have to buy a type of a thing. It is actually much cheaper. Um, and then after that, each of you'll notice each of the increases are four dollars a year, which is about a three percent increase. She would ask for that three percent again. So instead of seeing one thirty, you would see one forty two. Instead of seeing one thirty four. You would see 146 through count through fiscal year 2021, and then for the final fiscal year of this agreement, we see uh, the price go from 138 to 150, which is the $12, and then this is the $4 extra each year. So that is what actually staff would be recommending at this point would be to if we actually would be for you guys to make the determination: Do you want her to get those insurances or not? If you do, will we agree to that higher price? I, I think that it is a fair price for us to agree to. I will, we will be talking more about this later because uh, I just found out that we are finally getting kicked out of the county's payroll and HR system completely. 
Um, it took a long time. Yeah, it's been and it's going to cause some other headaches for us, and we're probably going to need her help with some of that stuff as well, because she has experience in that area as well. So I definitely want to figure out how we keep her, but it's up to you guys if we want to keep that. If we want to have her get the professional and general liability insurance, it's going to cost us a few dollars more. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Kohler and then Vice Chairman. Yeah, so I met with Jason on Monday, and I am a contractor. And um, I'm not really sure what you're saying we're asking for. So I had said we should be looking for general liability for sure. If she drives for work, we should be getting automobile liability. If there are any employees, <coughs> which I don't think there are, then she doesn't need workers' comp. But I'm concerned about, I mean, I think her, I don't want to derail anything. I think the costs for a bookkeeper are exorbitant. But I understand we need her. We don't use her that much. I also think that you should see what the policy costs. Because my policy for a year, for being an environmental consultant, which is really difficult to get, as I explained to you, I went through 28 underwriters, is uh, $350 a year. And so if you're only paying her, if you're only using her for 30 hours a year, and maybe you might increase that getting kicked out of the county system, what are you paying for this insurance? I think my suggestion would be, but I'm just making a suggestion, don't have to do it, is look at the cost of the insurance. I don't think a bookkeeper's insurance would be more than $300 a year and do a prorate a share of that rather than increasing the hourly because you just reimburse her for part of the insurance. It would make more sense to me than increasing her hourly rate. But that's a suggestion. The other commissioners it may not like that. It may not be worth it because this is a valuable employee. She's technically not an employee, but yes, she is valuable. I am valuable contract. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, so um, we have a CPA that does our audit. I think we yes. rotate that every three years. Every six years. Six years, okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, so my question, more kind of the acquisition of services, I, I see this as more of a sole source that this person's experienced and knowledgeable and can transition quickly with the new contract versus someone that may not be familiar with our systems. But um, I, I think in general, you know, on a kind of go-forward basis, it would be good to have uh, some sort of language like that in the staff reports indicating the importance of uh, a person, uh, of this particular person, if it's so a, it's uh, doing book, bookkeeping services. Uh, and, and then is there any connection with this service we're acquiring uh, versus the CPA, which has a set time frame? Well, the, the CPA that we use does our audit. That's a completely different function than a bookkeeper. The reason actually why we have the bookkeeper is because we're no longer in the county system and our auditor said you need to have a bookkeeper in order for us not to write something in a report saying you need to have a bookkeeper. Um, that's at least my understanding of what occurred back in the day. It was clearly before my time. Um, so I get your point on that. So they, they are completely different functions. Um, one is to make sure, partly is to make sure that A, catch any errors I make in the books. It, like when I'm entering stuff into the system, but also B, she's doing a lot of stuff in Munis and pulling that stuff out uh, of Munis to, to get it into our system. And because Munis is a very difficult system to get it to work with our system, she set up the tr like how everything gets transferred. She gets all the data entered into the system. So that's Munis is always a more difficult thing to work with than your typical bookkeeping systems. So yeah, when Dennis is a project subcommittee when we met with her and, and how we were changing some of the classifications and things seem like she's very skilled and knowledgeable so I'm comfortable I just had a few okay. questions. Yes. I, I would suggest that it's reasonable to say we'd like to just reimburse you for the insurance costs rather than tack on to the hourly rate if you're willing to consider that. Okay. Basically that's what we're talking about. That's a, that a fantastic suggestion. I think we should just ask her to show you know they give you she may have gotten it through the company I suggested. Yeah, I think she did. Yes. Fixed costs. They do it online. You get a payment schedule. She should just show you what that is, and she should give you a prorated share yeah. of that if she has other clients. I think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. And I think, yeah, increasing the hourly rate doesn't make Well, I mean, potentially you could make more money. 
Yes, yeah. I mean, for us, it's, it's not that much. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other? I, I just going to ask about striking out the workers' comp. I understand she doesn't have an employee, employees, right. but it should still be in the contract. Should she have employees? I, I you can say that's applicable, yeah. so that if she does have employees. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you can say, well, you never said I had to have um, employees. Good point. Yeah. Very good. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing that, I will close public comment and bring it back to the commission. Uh, so, anyone want to uh, make a motion with these amendments? I'll, I'll move approval of contract with Lisa Shipman for bookkeeping services with those amendments as okay. we discussed. Moved by Vice Chair Murray. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Pius. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, item number eight. Okay, so item number eight is coming at us from Calafco. Um, they uh, occasionally will do these things. I'm actually trying to figure out how to make this bigger here. Um, so Calafco every few years does a run through of CKH to determine what is in there that is maybe old, outdated, isn't needed. Part of it is really like what are individual LAFCO specific items every once in a while, individual LAFCO will have an item that only accounts to them and they've done their business or aren't doing their business and they can get rid of that section of government code. So they came to us and, and asked, they asked us just after the uh, our last meeting, so we had to wait until this one to do it. Um, do we still want to keep that special section of government code that is just for Marin LAFCO that deals with the SASM districts um, and how mergers can occur there? There is a slightly different process than is traditional under for anyone else that wants to do mergers, um, that allows LAFCO to do it, and there's no protests allowed. Uh, this was attempted, you may remember, I'm sure one commissioner remembers it extremely well, in 2011 um, to try and, and do some of these mergers. As I say in my staff memo, I don't think we would ever, at least I personally as the executive officer, would never attempt to do that particular process the way it was done in 2011. But there is the potential still for mergers to occur, and this actually gives an extremely quick, a much cheaper way to do mergers than if we were just to get two of the thousand districts to agree to merge, the process you would have to go through would be longer and more expensive without this clause. So the question is, do we want to keep it in in the system, keep it as government code? CalAFCO will only ask for its removal through the state legislative process if we say it should be removed. If we stay silent or say no, don't remove it, they're going to leave it alone. They, they, they look. This is part of what they consider their omnibus bill. They look for nothing that has zero controversy behind it. If even one person says they don't like it, they don't do it in the omnibus bill. So this is part of that process, and they're simply asking us at this point, because it's been around for a while. This is kind of like the old, the, the newest of the old group that they're looking at. They're looking at stuff back from 1985. I mean, that's how far far back they're going with some of these codes. So it's. We have finally hit the period where we're old enough now to be part of that occasional review. It's not going to be an annual thing. They come back every few years and do it. So the question for the commission is, a, it's a policy decision I believe the commission makes, not me. So I will leave it up to all of you to decide if we want to say anything or stay quiet. Commissioner Pius, you want to ask me a question or make any comments? I'll, I'll make a comment since I'm the one who has a personal knowledge experience of it. The worst thing in everybody's mouth, the taste in their mouths in Mill Valley is LAFCO having this sword hanging over our heads that at any point LAFCO can say, we're going to now force you to consolidate. And that makes LAFCO a dirty word in Southern Marin. So it wasn't a good process to begin with. The only person who was in favor of it is now in Congress. So he probably doesn't care anymore. And so removing it from the code makes a whole lot of sense, and I would be very much in favor of that. So um, I imagine at the time there was quite a bit of work to get the special legislation passed with uh, some from view that you know, there should be some focus on uh, improvements in the area there. Uh, it seems like it got kind of caught up in the process. Uh, I guess my concern would be, are we bound to that special legislation if we move forward with the consolidation process in the future, uh, or if one of the uh, member agencies or the peoples of that area want to bring forward a consolidation effort? Does it have to go through that process that it was before? It does not have to go through that process. If it's on the books, we can use the process 
but we don't, it doesn't have to go through that process. But if you had, let's just say district one, like there's I think seven, technically seven different parts of SASM? There's six. Six, I'm sorry, six. So if let's just say two, <laughs> district one and district two, I'm not gonna pick them by name, I'm just gonna say district one and district two said, you know what, next time we do our MSR, we do all the work and they say, hey, you know what, we're similar enough, it actually now, right now, for whatever reason, makes sense for us to merge and we're all on board with it. This process would give us an extremely quick, simple way to do it. And I would personally, I would only recommend using this particular section of government code if I had those two district boards and the general public, or at least the two district boards saying, yes, we want to use it, and the general public not opposing the annexation. The, the only issue, Jason, is that you might not be in that seat. We might that is very true. I'm not be in this commission, so it could be misused. Exactly. And so someone who was here in 2011, quite honestly, uh, Sem then Assemblyman Huffman didn't ask Lapwood if you want this legislation. It was some external pressure that he did it because he wanted the combined sewer districts, basically. So that's what everyone, the, ended, the train was out of the station <laughs> and it was running. And so we were surprised that the legislation came down. And it was a four to three vote that defeated that yeah. happening because I feel strongly that this commission felt like it wasn't a proper process by using legislation to force this on people. And so I, I would be worried that a, a future commission would, could misuse it. And that would be my worry if it's still there. Because I don't think we need it. I think we have the process in place. And I like the public part of the process. And at the end of the day, that's what we voted, was the public had a right to vote. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's the history. Okay. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the commission for any further discussion. I think we've had two strong opinions of on this side of the room. Anybody <laughs> on this side of the room have any opinions? I would just say that hearing from the two commissioners, it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and delete this section so that we can have a public process, which is for my newness. And just having been on Fairfax Town Council for a number of years, public process is really the way to go. So I would support deleting this section. Vice Chair Marie? Uh, well, I, I just, if it doesn't hurt one way or another, but I certainly uh, understand uh, Commissioner Perdoni's position that, and that it could, could be used uh, in a way that our current executive officer indicates not. And uh, I think if it was not for uh, one of the county supervisors on the LAFCO board, there was quite a bit of discussion about public input. And that's where um, I was an alternate at that time. That's, that's basically, that was the whole crux of it. So uh, if there's some concern about that going forward and it's not a benefit of Marin Lapco, and this is uh, really the creation of the state, uh, even though we are a state agency and we implement state policies, uh, then I, I think for the, at least the people of Marin, maybe something we might want to just let it go at this point and then see what we need in the future. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, highlight a section of the staff report here that says uh, if we delete the section, it would send a signal that the commission has no desire to force reorganizations that are not supported by the local agency and or general public. And I think that is a signal that we want to send. That's so I, I, I'm in agreement. Um, so I think you have your, your motion. Or your I think you, you, it's good that if you did a motion stating what you wanted, since there's not a staff recommendation on this one, it would be good just to have a motion that states what you're okay. looking to do. I, I think as part of the motion, I think it's important to talk about local control. And that, uh, that, that we appreciate the state's uh, interest, but uh, we, we are more in lab going, and we, we should have uh, some local control. Do you want to make a motion or do you want to make a motion? I would like to have the honor of making the motion okay. to uh, support removal of 56375.2 from the government code. Okay. Second. Moved by Commissioner Pius and seconded by Commissioner Rodoni. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. That was a very good discussion. I'm glad uh, that was the, the case and I talked about, and I was, felt it was really important to bring to the full board. So I'm glad that we had that robust discussion. Okay, and we are now moving to executive officer report. We're cranking along today. Sure. Uh, I'll try and go through these as quickly as I can. I will run through them, but raise your hand if you want to stop me while I'm going through one before I jump to the next one. Um, so budget update, we're doing fine on our budget. We're a little bit below where we should be for spending, which is always, I find, a good thing. I'd rather be below than above, although the one small caveat I will, I will put is 
A big bill that I'm expecting is we haven't received a bill from Plan West for two or three months now. I'm not in any encouragement to get them to us the bill until the end of the fiscal year because we can hold on to the money a little bit longer. But that that is missing out of there. So you will when they send us the next bill, it will be for a few thousand dollars, which will add the percentage of our stuff. So I want to give like there's a reason why we're a little bit lower than we should be right now. Uh, um, will you just uh, um, share with the commission what we talked about about the insurance? Oh the yeah, insurance is more? There, there's yeah. one line item that you will notice that's already over 100%. Um, as we were redoing the budget, you, you may remember we redid line items. I think there may have been one of our insurance policies that was for some reason covered under a different line item in past years. And so as we were redoing the budget, Every bill that comes in now, I look at it individually. It used to be like, I look, oh, what was it last time we paid that bill? And it just stayed in the same category. Every bill that comes in this year, I am recategorizing it. So on that particular item, I think we, we just had one of our insurance policies for some reason put in a different category in past years, and I have corrected that. So you see that our when I went back and looked how much we paid, it's not that much more than we paid in previous years. It went up a little bit, but that's to be cost of living, cost, you know, those increases occur. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. So that one, while it does show being over in our budget, I just think that was not understanding exactly which each individual bill was for and it being tagged wrong in the past year. Um, so that's closer to what I, we've gotten, I think, all of our insurance bills for this year. So what you'll see next year is a number that's closer to that. And one of the other line items will probably drop by a bit because we'll realize we don't spend as much in that category as we thought. The other thing I'll also add to budget that I remembered is because we didn't attend CalAFCO, we had one commissioner who attended for only part of CalAFCO, we didn't have the same costs that we normally would for the annual conference. So once again, that's another thing that takes a few percentage points down of what we've spent so far this year. So, um, and also since it was in Sacramento, we could drive to it rather than having to fly. You know, there's a lot of things that this year's uh, conference line is going to end up being smaller than previous years. So just keep that in mind when we're doing next year's budget. Yeah, yes, this year some items might be a little bit lower. Um, so that's all I have on budget. Um, uh, budget yeah. So um, Jason, I just want to clarify so the insurance line item, the classification is shown 159%. So it's really just kind of a catch all for. Yes. And we'll clarify that, or the budget committee will clarify that. In the yeah. Budget. One thing to remember is when, I, when we redid the budget, is I merge everything up into big picture line items. If you ever want to see, that's why you have the budget reconciliation stuff. So you can always go back and see every single check that we write. So you can go back to all of our previous packets and see here's what we spent on each for each individual thing. These are just meant to be high level, big picture, like professional services that sucks in a lot of different, that sucks in our bookkeeper that has our plan west, that has several different things. Communications is like all of our IT. I'm actually looking at renaming our communications line item next time to IT and communications because it's really our phones and our internet and our you know IT support all get wrapped into that. So all of the line items are just big picture. If you ever have a question on what's being spent on an individual area, let me know and I can pull up either an individual one, I can pull up it all, whatever you're looking for. Because of QuickBooks, it's not too difficult to do as long as I understand what you're looking for. Thank you. All right, uh, so then going on to current and pending proposals, we, we had uh, two applications in front of us today uh, that are moving forward. The one that I think has been the big one that I, that I know Commissioner Murray has asked about in the past is a <coughs> annexation into the water district, the Northern Marin Water District. Um, that application tomorrow is its last day to do anything. Otherwise, if after tomorrow we have not gotten the conditions met, that application will automatically die based on state government code. I reached out in September, I've reached out after the last meeting before this one, reminded the applicant that their deadline is coming up. I have not heard anything from them in several months. This is Lucas Valley, and we're waiting for an MMWD. MMWD, not yeah. North yeah. 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 I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we were waiting for that to, yeah, so yeah, to water yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we are, we were waiting, we never heard anything back from them. If they want to continue with it, they'll have to submit a new application in the future and we can go through the process again. I would encourage them, if they submit next time, make sure they have all their agreements in place with the water district before they come back to us. But that's been sitting there, you know, I've been told multiple times since I've been here, which is now going on a year and a half, that they were close to an agreement, and then every time after I, they said, oh, we, someone changed their mind on something, and the, the, the I that got dotted wasn't dotted correctly, and it was like little stuff like that that really occurred. So Jason, uh, we did approve annexation into the San Diego District. Before my time, yes. That does not change. No. Just on a go forward basis, even though they're both linked, uh, now are they uh, broken and 
one, they, one once track, it's just that one. We divided the file, so they no longer were linked once you divided the file. Okay. So the sanitary district, that's, that's been recorded. That's, that was done long before I ever showed up. Um, this water one has been sitting here and you've given them you know, extensions. This time they didn't ask for an extension, so maybe they decided we're clearly not going to come to a final resolution, we're not going to spend any more money on this thing, and they, they let it die. Um, when we can, they haven't received service from MFWD. To my knowledge, they, they shouldn't be. I mean, I don't go out and check individual meters, but they shouldn't be. Yeah, but from MFWD hasn't checked yeah. that they have. No, and MFWD has been very clear what they're looking for, and they, they have not been willing to like negotiate, like to do anything. It's not like where it was an out of service, like an emergency out of service agreement. Like with the, a lot of times, this is what happens on the sewer side: is you get connected because it's an emergency situation and then they never fit, follow up and finish the process. We're actually going through one of those right now. That's gonna be the next thing I was gonna talk about right. is there is the, um, there's San Rafael Sanitary District has a connection. Um, they never have, they never came back to us and did the proper, got the proper approvals on it. From what I understand is they ran their system across the neighbor's parcel, never got an easement right to it. Um, they claimed that the neighbor was fine with it and was refusing to sign any documents the person whose application this is, I understand, is in the construction industry, so you'd think they would understand what an easement and having the rights for an easement would mean. Um, so that application died quite a while ago. We've been working with San Rafael uh, Sanitary District to figure out how to disconnect them because they should not be connected anymore. They have to go back to septic, which the county's not gonna let them do. So at some point in time, I anticipate them, the, the sanitary district, I talked with them after the last meeting and because of the holidays, they're putting it on their agenda to have a discussion about this connection in their, at their January meeting. So at some point after that, they should be moving forward with the disconnect. Our hope and our goal has always been to give the, the applicant as much time as possible to come back and resubmit an application, get everything that they need to do, because we're honestly not trying to disconnect these people. My last option is to disconnect. But if they don't go through the process, we have no choice but to force a disconnection to occur. And that's the process we're going down San Rafael has been very, it's been one of those back burner things for both me and San Rafael, so occasionally like, it'll go a couple months before I, one of us remembers to say something to the other one, but we have been working together to try and figure out how to get a properly disconnect. Uh, they went and reviewed with the county, talked to some people, so they've been going through the process. In January, they're gonna have a hearing on it, and that will hopefully be the last step if the applicant doesn't come in, they get disconnected. I just want to see on the list, are you talking about the Burnside Way? Um, no, yeah. it's in the uh, Margarita Drive. Margarita Drive. Margarita Drive. Yeah, it's Margarita Drive. It's 1328 is the file number. It's it's in your packet. It's under deemed terminated because for us it has been deemed terminated. But I'm leaving it on there simply for the purposes of it reminds me every couple of months I'm supposed to talk to San Rafael at the very least. Okay. And what are the what are the implications of someone getting terminated as a result of this? Do we have any liability for that? I mean, it was a condition, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's very clear under state law that it needs to be done within a certain period of time. Yeah. So. Or they have to come back to us and ask for, for, for an extension, and they never came back to us and asked for right. the extension. Okay. There's a lot of correspondence yeah. in this file. Okay. So I, I, just so clarification, then we will direct the citation agents that disconnect the service. We've already done that. Okay. And like, they're aware of this clause. They're aware. Of, they're aware of it. They're going through. They're having their meeting in January to to be given instructions to physically go ahead and do it. Once again, we're taking a slow path because we're hoping the applicant will come back and fix the situation because they do need to be hooked up and we don't want to like cut them off and all of a sudden, within a couple days, their whole system is backed up because it's not flowing anywhere. All right, anything else? That's, okay, so that's all I had on current and pending. Yeah. Um, so, update on NSRs. Uh, we had a discussion about Nevada. Um, Jared is promising me by the end of this calendar year that the East Peninsula, which is Tiburon, Double Deer, uh, Strawberry area, will be out. Uh, we will put that out for comment. Um, I think what I'm going to do this time is normally we have the comment period end with our commission meeting where we do the report. I'm actually realizing if someone shows up to the meeting and has comments and wants to write us a letter, like that we should actually have a week or two after that to really have the end of the comment period so they can hear what our presentation is, make any comments on that that they want as well, and really give people enough time. So what our goal is to put it out for public comment, have it end at some point in February, um, but have our, our official draft, like we've done with Plan West, 
They won't be doing it anymore. We will be doing it. One of the things that we will need to figure out is where we want to host it. One of the things that has always come up in the past is we like to host where the MSR is. Unfortunately, we don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there are no um, areas that have the TV hookup system that are in the physical MSR area. So the question is, do we just meet here? Do we try and go to the closest location to the area um, and just figure out where the closest place is and see if they're available to meet? Um, so it will be things that will work out for our February meeting. Um, so we may end up moving the February meeting from here to somewhere else just based on what we think we can get done correctly there. And where is this location? Uh, it would be somewhere in the Tiburon Belvedere Strawberry area is where the MSR itself is covering and none of those jurisdictions in that area are yet hooked up to the TV yeah, system. Yeah, I sit on the board of the community media center. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. And that's, that's, so the question comes, and we'll maybe have a discussion about this at our February workshop, is do we want to go as close as we can, or do we want to just keep the meeting here? Because we aren't that far away from the area, um, and this room is set up and works normally, excluding the mice today, normally works well for us. Um, so we, you know, we, we have some options, and we'll figure it out and move along on that one. Um, so that is all I have for the MSR updates. Um, and then finally, the strategic plan workshop that is scheduled for January 8th in this room starting at 9 o'clock. We are going from 9 to 1, um, so please be here on time. We will have quite a bit to discuss. Uh, if there's anything else, I've, I have, have had a discussion with uh, Bill, who's the one who runs our workshops for us. Um, so we've already put together a draft agenda for it. If there's any last minute comments you want to make on things you want to see that weren't made at the last meeting, because he's listened to that meeting, so he's, he's heard everything you had to say at the last meeting. But if there's anything that you want to say at this meeting, now is a good time to do it, and he'll take a review of it and we'll work that into our, our plans. And we're not doing LAFCA 101 like we've done in the past. Correct. Um, so if anyone wants any of that LAFCA 101 stuff, I think we you know, connect with Jason directly. Um, but yeah, any other comments? I've already done LAFCA 101. Yes, you have. So is it 9 to 3? 9, 9 to 1. 1. Oh. We, uh, we, based on comments last time, you said cut it down, so we cut it down. And once again, one o'clock is really depends on how much you talk. So if you wanted to get up quicker, don't talk as much, but that doesn't really work for the workshop, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, can I, I, I assume we're on the commissioner announcements and requests. Uh, are, are you? I am done with the street. Okay. If yes. you're done with the street, your workshop, <laughs> I am too. Okay, um, yep, commissioner So let me go to the request first. Uh, uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to hear, uh, Sasha, if you could kind of explain what happened at the Calafco conference with the mm -hmm. balance of the board and audience. And then, uh, uh, Jason, I'd like, and thank you for announcing it, uh, for us to recognize and close the meeting in honor of Larry Boder and his wife and condolences to him and his family uh, during this time, okay. if the board approved. Sure. Uh, so um, I, I did attend the Cal Africa conference, but I only attended just to do our vote. Um, the, uh, as you may recall, the uh, power was out uh, up until that day. So uh, I had planned to go the, um, on the Wednesday and go to some of the uh, actual meetings, but uh, you know, the power was out here because of the public safety power shutoff. So I did not attend on that day. So I just went to put in our vote as the commission um, had requested that we kind of not rock the vote on the dues increase, so I uh, followed direction and um, uh, supported the dues increase. Okay, any other commissioner announcements or requests? No? Okay, then uh, seeing none, we will go ahead and adjourn to our strategic planning workshop Wednesday, January 8th, 9 a.m. right here in this room. Thank you very much.